Hello, and welcome to the next episode of Best of the Day at the 14th International Myeloma Workshop in Kyoto, Japan. I'm Dr. Sagar Lonial from Emory University, and today I'm joined with Dr. Robert Orlowski from MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. Dr. Orlowski? Well, thanks, Sagar, for having me on to talk about all the exciting things going on in relapsed and refractory myeloma. All right, great. Well, let's get to it. Let's talk first about proteasome inhibitors, some of the new data with carfilzomib, carfilzomib combinations, MLN9708, and aprozomib. Well, as you've mentioned, we have two proteasome inhibitors that are currently approved in the relapsed and or refractory setting, one being bortezomib, the other being carfilzomib. Mm -hmm. And carfilzomib right now is approved predominantly as a single agent. But there are a number of studies moving forward with carfilzomib combinations, mm -hmm. which look really quite attractive. One that we didn't unfortunately hear at this meeting, but hopefully will by the ASH meeting, mm -hmm. is the combination of carfilzomib with lenalidomide and dexamethasone. And hopefully what we'll have are the data from the Aspire study, which was a large phase three comparing Lendex mm -hmm. as the standard versus carfilzomib Lendex. And I think we all suspect that that will be a very positive study and will lead to full approval of carfilzomib. Mm -hmm. Some of the other combinations that look really interesting, of course, we know from a lot of work from Ken Anderson's group that proteasome inhibitors and immunomodulatory drugs are especially good in combination. Mm -hmm. So people have combined, for example, carfilzomib with pomalidomide, mm -hmm. which also was just recently approved in the relapsed and or refractory setting. Right. And there's a study from the Academic Myeloma Consortium, which has been updated at this meeting, actually, mm -hmm. which showed that by combining the currently approved dose of carfilzomib as well as the currently approved dose of pomalidomide mm -hmm. along with dexamethasone, the response rate in the relapsed and refractory setting is a shade over 75%, mm -hmm. which is really quite impressive. Right. And hopefully that will be something that will make a big difference in that setting because each of the drugs by itself is certainly very active, but we could do better and mm -hmm. hopefully this will be one way that we can. And the nice thing about it is since both drugs are now approved, this may be an option that you can do off of trial, mm -hmm. although ideally we'd of course right. like for patients to go on study so that we could fully define the activity of the combination. So what about um, adverse events for that combination? Because I agree it's a very powerful and potent combination, but when you put two drugs together at full dose basically, um, you can run into some problems. Yeah, it's a good point. Fortunately, even though neuropathy is a signal a little bit with carfilzomib, much less so than bortezomib, mm -hmm. and there's been some neuropathic signal with pomalidomide as well, mm -hmm. with the combination, there were really very low incidence of neuropathic events. And in general, it's been a very well-tolerated combination. Mm -hmm. I would actually venture to say that we could probably give a higher dose of carfilzomib in the combination mm -hmm. than was defined in this study. But I think they were appropriately very conservative in what they defined as dose-limiting toxicities. Mm -hmm. But it may be in the future that we could go to higher doses of carfilzomib, as has been shown, may be safe in, for example, Nicoletta Lenvi's study right. from Memorial Sloan Kettering, where they did 20 milligrams for the first couple of days and then went up to 56 milligrams per meter squared when the carfilzomib was given over a longer period of time as mm -hmm. an infusion. Okay, so what about some of the oral inhibitors, the new kids on the block? Yeah, definitely. So we've got two oral proteasome inhibitors that are in clinical trials now. One is from Millennium and is a boronic acid inhibitor, sort of along the lines of bortezomib, mm -hmm. and that's called ixazomib. And then there's an oral proteasome inhibitor, which is an epoxy ketone, similar to carfilzomib in terms of the warhead, if you will, mm -hmm. and that's called a prozomib. And there are nice data with ixazomib, both alone as well as in combination with lenalidomide and dexamethasone that show that it's a very active drug, especially in combination. Mm -hmm. And there is an ongoing phase three trial looking at lenalidomide and dexamethasone as the standard of care 
for one to three prior lines of therapy mm -hmm. compared to the three drug regimen of Lendex with Ixazomib. And so that will be an all oral regimen for relapsed myeloma. And I think, again, we all suspect that that will be a positive trial, although it hasn't finished enrolling yet. But that would be exciting to have an all oral regimen in the setting for relapsed patients. And sort of along those lines, I'll put in a plug for something that's not necessarily in the relapsed setting, but at MD Anderson, we're doing a pilot study of lenalidomide with the oral ixazomib mm -hmm. as a maintenance therapy mm -hmm. in the post-transplant setting, because I think certainly one of the areas where oral inhibitors will be exciting is in the area of maintenance treatment. Mm -hmm. And we probably, we hope, can do better than lenalidomide alone, mm -hmm. which is what would be the standard of care right now. Right, right. And finally, aprosimib. Oprosimib, a great idea there. Also an oral drug in the same class as carfilzomib is showing some activity as a single agent. Probably moving forward, as with most of these mm -hmm. drugs, combinations will be the way to go. Right. And so there are plans to do a study combining oprosimib with lenalidomide and dexamethasone. Mm -hmm. And it would be also interesting to do oprosimib with pomalidomide and right. dexamethasone. Right. So hopefully these combinations will emerge over the next couple of meetings and move forward to try to improve, hopefully, outcomes as mm -hmm. well as convenience and toxicity. So when we, let's switch gears a little bit to the new IMIDs. Pomalidomide is the latest uh, drug that's been approved in the U.S. Um, at ASH, we saw a couple of studies that were presented with POM-based combinations. Some of those are presented here at this meeting again. And it's very interesting because you can combine it with carfilzomib, as you described. You can combine it with cyclophosphamide. You can combine it with biaxin. And it looks like they all have pretty, until the update of the carfilzomib combination, comparable response rates. How, how, do, how, do, how should clinicians approach POMs? POM DEX, like the label, or think about combinations as we've seen in these studies? Well, I think POMDEX is certainly the standard of care right now, mm -hmm. and although it can be combined with other drugs, the data for those combinations is still a little bit limited. But I would say that some of the combinations you mentioned are very exciting, with pomalidomide, dexamethasone, and bortezomib being one example that right. you didn't mention. So Paul Richardson did a phase one study where there were no dose-limiting toxicities. Not too often that you see mm -hmm. a phase one with no DLTs. Right. And the response rate there was very robust. And of course, that is the strategy which is being moved forward to get full approval of pomalidomide mm -hmm. in a study of bortezomib and dexamethasone as the standard versus pomalidomide with bortezomib and dexamethasone. Mm -hmm. So that combination, considering, again, no dose-limiting toxicities, would certainly be an exciting one to try to use in the clinic. You talked about carfilzomib and pomalidomide and dex, which, because the drugs are all approved, people can use right now. Mm -hmm. There's a combination of pomalidomide with cyclophosphamide and prednisone from Antonio Palumbo. Mm -hmm. My only concern about that is that because myelosuppression is the main side effect of pomalidomide, adding another drug that has some myelosuppression, you would have to be a little bit selective so that people who have robust counts would probably be good candidates. But if you've got somebody with a marginal white count or a marginal platelet count, mm -hmm. that might not be the best combination there. And then the biaxin combination mm -hmm. with pomalidomide and dex looked very exciting as well. And the theory behind that in part is that biaxin may help by reducing metabolism of the corticosteroid. So I think any of these would be very appropriate. Mm -hmm. Maybe one approach one could take, although this hasn't been tested or right. even validated, would be to start with pomalidomide and dex for one or two cycles. Mm -hmm. And if people have a great response, then continue. But if the response is not the optimal one, maybe add these other drugs in so that you hopefully can get a much better response rate. Yeah, yeah. It's certainly interesting, and, and it's nice to have so many new options to be able to treat patients with Definitely. at this point. So the new other class that we're very excited about are the monoclonals. Sure. Um, not a huge amount of data on monoclonals presented here, but I think we're certainly excited about the data. 
Definitely. There are a number of these drugs. I think the exciting thing is that we hope in the future that there will not be evidence for cross-resistance against one antibody if you right. then come back with another. Part of the problem, for example, with proteasome inhibitors and also IMIDs mm -hmm. is that we know that if patients have disease that did not respond well to one drug in that class, mm -hmm. the chances of a good response to a second drug in that class are lower. Not to the point that you shouldn't try it, but there is some cross resistance. Right. With antibodies, that may not be the case. And of course, elatuzumab, which you've been very involved with, is very far along in the development process and the study that will hopefully lead to its approval, which is Lendex with elatuzumab mm -hmm. versus Lendex has already finished enrollment. And hopefully next year, we will have some data from that that will lead to its approval. Mm -hmm. Other antibodies that look exciting, there are anti-CD38 antibodies, mm -hmm. one that's known as daratumumab, looks like it has single agent activity without the addition of other drugs, mm -hmm. which leaves open the possibility that it may be able to go into an accelerated approval setting. Although again, probably combinations as with lenalidomide would be the best ways to go in the future. And hopefully what we'll see is that even if patients progress on an antibody to one of the cell surface proteins on myeloma cells, they will have an equal benefit to an antibody that targets a different cell surface protein. Mm -hmm. So that would be really great. And mm -hmm. especially since in general, the side effects from these antibodies are relatively modest mm -hmm. compared with some of the other drug classes because they tend not to target too many normal cells in the body. Right, right. Um, and I guess the uh, sort of grab bag class, the other signal transduction inhibitors, whatever you want to call them, the non-proteasome inhibitor, non-antibody classes. <laughs> um, you've done a lot of work with KSP in the lab as well as in the clinic. Why don't we start there? Well, and both of us have worked on the Array 520 compound, and I think all of us agree that the new IMIDs and the new proteasome inhibitors and the monoclonal antibodies are a big step forward, mm -hmm. but it would be really nice to try to further improve outcomes to have not just new drugs in old classes, mm -hmm. but new drugs in new classes with new mechanisms of action. And Array 520 is one of those it inhibits a protein which is important to cell division of myeloma cells and does seem to have single agent activity. I think you have an abstract at this meeting updating the experience which shows that there is a definite response rate even in patients who have disease that is refractory to lenalidomide mm -hmm. and bortezomib and dexamethasone which we call triple refractory right. patients. And that's a very difficult patient population to treat for which some of the other drugs have limited data. So that's exciting. And we've also done at Anderson a combination with carfilzomib mm -hmm. and Array 520. And you've done a combination with bortezomib and Array 520, mm -hmm. which shows that you can add this drug to a proteasome inhibitor. So hopefully one of these approaches will turn out to be the best to bring out the activity of this drug. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a definite role to play for that agent. It's just a matter of doing the right studies to show that it has a role in our armamentarium. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I mean, I've been struck by patients who you don't have a lot left to do for uh, really having nice and often long-lived responses yeah. uh, to, to the target. It's, it's, it's very interesting. The other nice thing about it is the main side effect is myelosuppression, mm -hmm. which is something that we know how to take care of. Mm -hmm. We give people nupogen, and that usually is enough to ameliorate that. Right. And it does not have any neuropathy because the target for the drug is not expressed in nerve tissue. Mm -hmm. So that's always a plus considering neuropathy is still a concern for patients with myeloma. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about any, any, other, any other new or interesting targets you saw that caught your eye at the meeting? Well, I think we have a lot of exciting targets outside of the classes that you mentioned. Right. There are some people working on, for example, ibrutinib, mm -hmm. which may have some effect on the microenvironment in myeloma. 
and there are other targets that may be interesting as well. For example, some of the BRD inhibitors that may reduce MYC levels, and I think the more we understand the molecular aspects of myeloma, the more data come out about the importance of MYC, and therefore any drug which reduces MYC levels is going to be exciting. So some of these bromodomain inhibitors that look like they're going to be entering clinical trials, I think look exciting, especially because patients with the most aggressive types mm -hmm. of myeloma probably have high MYC levels right. because it drives the cells to divide. And so it would be really great to have a drug for those high-risk patients. Mm -hmm. So let's, uh, let's give uh, the audience a little uh, sense of how, um, how you put all these options available off of clinical trials. Obviously, when you have a trial available, that's what we all would like to do. Um, but um, how do you, now that we have so many things you can do in the early and late relapse settings, how do you sort of think about it when you see a patient? Well, that's a great question, and this is, I think, where still the art of medicine mm -hmm. is very important, mm -hmm. because although we have a lot of data, they still don't clearly say that one approach is better than another, and it's very important to have a discussion with each patient, take into account their other medical problems, how they have tolerated previous therapy, mm -hmm. how the myeloma has responded to previous therapy, and use those as a guideline. But I think one algorithm that one could follow, and again, this has not been validated, right. but if one were to use lenalidomide, bortezomib, and dexamethasone as the induction of choice, which many of us think in the US is the best approach, and then follow that, for example, with stem cell transplant and then some kind of maintenance afterwards for people who progress, there's now a panoply of options. One approach, of course, would be to add back bortezomib and increase the dose of lenalidomide, mm -hmm. especially if patients had very good tolerability and a long duration of benefit. But some of the studies that have been done recently suggest that, as is the case up front, in the relapsed setting, patients who are able to tolerate three drug combination regimens do better in terms of progression-free survival and overall survival than people who get two drug regimens. It's clearly not for everybody. You have to have somebody who is robust and is interested in an approach that's fairly aggressive. But I would suggest doing something like carfilzomib, pomalidomide, and dexamethasone as a first salvage approach after prior induction with bortezomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone. Hopefully other options in the future yeah. will include some of the monoclonal antibodies. But the exciting thing is that I think in the past we tended to save our quote unquote best drugs because we didn't have much that we could offer patients mm -hmm. when they relapsed. Now with the large array of drugs that we have, we don't really have to worry about that concern. There will be other drugs that we can offer them. And so I think it makes sense for those who can tolerate more aggressive salvage, if you will, mm -hmm. to go ahead with that rather than try to do the give them one drug here and then one drug there, because it seems like the benefit of a better consolidation or salvage regimen mm -hmm. is going to be superior to a less complex or kind of like a doublet, if you will, regimen. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think it's a, it is certainly an exciting time, and with all these new drugs, I think it's, um, with different adverse event profiles, I think it's always a challenge to know what to do, when to do it, and how to combine it, but I, I completely agree with the idea of not being stingy on using good drugs, uh, because I think we've all learned that for the most part, the earlier you go in the disease, the more effective a given drug or class of drugs is going to be, and saving them doesn't always let them work as well as they could. Definitely, and as we debated earlier today mm -hmm. about minimal residual disease, we all know that no matter what measurement of minimal residual right. disease you use, reaching MRD is better for outcomes mm -hmm. than not reaching MRD, right. and you're much more likely to achieve that with a combination regimen as opposed to a singlet or even a doublet. Right, right. Okay, well, thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me again. All right. 
Well, thank you for joining us on Best of the Day from the 14th International Myeloma Workshop. Please join us tomorrow for the next episode.